Hello everyone, welcome to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth, I am the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium, and this week's episode, we're covering the dates of December 7th through December 13th. And what we'll take a look at is a really nice winter star called Capella that is now rising higher and higher up that you may have noticed. We'll talk about the planets, give you an update on those, and the lead up to the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, and we'll talk about the peak of the annual Geminid meteor shower by the end of the week. So let's get to it. Even though we're not officially in winter time yet, we are starting to see some winter objects make their appearance in the early evening sky. And one great example of that is in the northeast. You may have already spotted what looks like an extraordinary bright star right here. And it really is. It's actually the sixth brightest star we call Capella. And Capella is a star that if you're a more southern area of the world, you don't see all year round. But if you're in the more northern parts, you can see it for the entire year. It's a circumpolar star. So that means it just makes a big circle in the northern part of the sky. But for us here, more in the southern parts of the US, we don't see all year round. So we're just starting to see it now rise above the northeast. And it's also called Alpha Origae which tells us that it's the brightest star in a relatively obscure, not as well-known constellation called Auriga, which has this sort of six-sided, loosely six-sided shape that we see here. And Auriga, which is supposed to be a charioteer, is not well-known. There's not a lot of information about it, but we can put up the outline, and there's the shape I mentioned earlier. And believe it or not, it's supposed to be a person and in some artwork he's holding goats so either he's a charioteer or he's the goat herdsman is what he's sometimes commonly known actually the star capella the name actually means she goat or nanny goat you can actually see a goat that he's holding at least in the picture here and if I turn off that picture and you look carefully there's a small little triangle next to capella right here really tiny little asterism and so that is supposed to represent at least these two stars, the little goats. So this little triangle is quite noticeable if you're looking in this area. And I'll turn back the picture here and you'll see the little goats here that those two stars represent. So for goat herders, this was kind of an important constellation and star and it represents that from Greek mythology. But again, there's not much mythology or even stories that support this constellation, but it's been around for quite some time. Now what is interesting about the star Capella, it's not only one of the brighter stars in the sky, again ranked sixth among all stars you can see at night, but it's also a multiple star system. It's made up of four stars, what we call a quadruple star system, and the yellowish golden color that you see from Capella is actually mostly coming from two yellow giant stars called Capella A and B. One star, Capella A, is about 78 times as bright as our sun and about 12 times larger, and Capella B is about 72, 73 times brighter and about eight and a half to nine times the size of our sun. So they're at the end of their lives, starting to bloat up into their red giant phase after they ate up all of their hydrogen in their core and are fusing heavier elements. Then there's two other smaller stars that don't really contribute any to the brightness of the system. Those are called Capella H and L. And these are very small red dwarf stars. So the two yellow larger stars, Capella A and B, orbit pretty close to each other, about three quarters of the distance that we orbit our sun. And Capella H and L orbit each other a little farther away, about between the orbit of Neptune and Pluto is from our sun. And those pairs orbit each other at about 10,000 astronomical units, about 15% a light year. And so it sounds kind of crazy and complicated, but that's how a lot of these multiple star systems can form. You can have binaries going around other binaries, and it makes for an interesting system to study. This is an interesting graphic. It shows kind of a rough idea of the relative sizes of the Capella system compared to our sun labeled as Sol. And Capella A and B, as you see, are very large yellow giant stars, much bigger than our sun and a little bit cooler, but they are brighter. And Capella H and L are very small red dwarf stars that are smaller than our sun. And so those two pairs, the large yellow stars and small red stars, 
orbit around each other in this fantastic system. But for us here on Earth, it looks like one goldish yellowish star that marks kind of the beginning of winter as you see it in the early evening rising out of the northeast. As I mentioned recently, the planets for this month are truly extraordinary. I just want to give you an update on what's going on. And if we look in the southwest, we're starting to see Jupiter and Saturn just get so close to each other. They're nearing the great conjunction that occurs on the 21st of this month. So I just want to continue talking about this event because it's really an amazing thing that doesn't happen very often. Last time these two planets were seen this close, observed, was the year 1226 in the medieval times. So it's a very rare occurrence to have a conjunction like this with Jupiter and Saturn, again called a great conjunction. And as we go through this week, you're going to see them getting closer and closer to each other in the southwest, but also a little bit closer to the sun. So you're going to have to look right after sunset in this area of the sky. Now we can't also forget another planet that is still out. It is by itself, but it's still looking really nice. Way up in the eastern part of the sky, we have a really nice view of Mars that we see here. And Mars is not as bright as it was in October when we're at closest approach to the planet, closer than we've been in some years. So it's a bit dimmer now, now that we're moved farther away from the planet, but it's still shines pretty brightly as this reddish looking non-twinkling star so definitely take a look at mars pretty high up after sunset so it's nice and easy to spot and for those early morning folks you look towards the east before sunrise and what we have here is our moon which is waning right now so you're seeing less and less of it starting to approach the brightest planet in our sky Venus just above the eastern horizon that you see there. So if I speed up time through the week, we'll find that the moon will get closer and closer to that planet as we approach this nice moon-Venus conjunction. And by the 12th, by the weekend, you'll see the very, very thin crescent moon next to Venus. We can zoom into that to give us a better view of this. And so that could make for just a really nice treat if you're looking towards the east in the morning or if you're walking on the beach in the morning. Uh, or even taking pictures of this, this could be a really nice sight. Perhaps one of the more interesting celestial events coming up soon is the peak of the annual Geminid meteor shower, which occurs by the end of this week and into early next week. And this meteor shower gets its name from the constellation it radiates out of, which are the Gemini twins, which we can see here, rising in the east a little bit later in the evening. It is a wintertime constellation and what you can find are the two heads of the twins Pollux and Castor they're the brightest stars in the constellation with their sort of stick figure bodies sort of sticking out in this direction here turn on their pictures as well to see them a little bit better so near the head of Castor right about here is the radiant point for the Geminids so that's where you can trace the meteors back from if you watch them throughout the whole sky but you'll see them all over the place and this meteor shower usually runs from December 4th through December 17th. Just so happens for this particular peak, it will be on the evening of the 13th and the morning of the 14th and some days around that. So the good thing about this meteor shower is it has a broad maximum output, which means that you don't need to be at a very specific time to see the most meteors. And you can even start in the evening. So starting around the 9, 10 o'clock time frame, Gemini will already be up in the sky. And the later you stay up, the better, because this will be higher and higher up. And the really prime viewing time is from midnight until dawn. So what is really fortunate this year is that the new moon occurs on the 14th. So we don't have extra light pollution from reflected light from the moon obscuring the meteors for this particular meteor shower this year, which is great. And this particular shower is one of the best all year. You can have up to 120 meteors per hour or maybe more depending on the meteor stream we are moving through and if you're in a dark location, that makes all the difference. If you're not, that's okay too, but that really increases your chances for seeing this, especially on a moonless night that we're getting for this particular peak. So if you have some patience, allow your eyes to adjust to the darkness on a really nice clear night, you may have a really good show for the Geminids this time around. Other than the decent prospects for a really good show this year, 
What makes the Geminids quite interesting is where the meteors come from. Normally meteors come from the debris trail of comets that are left behind by the parent comet as it goes around the sun and we move through that debris field at the same time each year. But for the Geminids, we're actually going through the debris field of an asteroid instead. This asteroid is called 3200 Phaethon. It's quite an interesting object and it was actually discovered quite recently in 1983. It's pretty small, has about a one and a half year orbit around the sun and it behaves in really odd ways. Some folks believe it could be a dead comet, a comet that ran out of ice and became this sort of dark rocky object. Some people call it a rocky comet, sort of like a comet without the ice that leaves debris from the interaction with the sun. But it's in a very weird place. And so this particular asteroid is still a conundrum for astronomers, but does leave behind something that we can appreciate each year in the middle of December. And to get a better look at this asteroid, back in 2017, the really large, a thousand foot wide radio telescope in Puerto Rico, which is called Arecibo, bounced light beams off the asteroid during a close flyby of Earth. It was about 1.1 million miles away from us during this flyby in 2017, and it gave us radar images like this. And it showed us the size, the shape, the spin rate for 3200 Phaethon to give us a better understanding of this particular asteroid because it's a near-Earth asteroid, a type of asteroid that comes very close to us, which makes it a potentially hazardous one among many other asteroids. So it's important to study these objects to better protect us and plan for the future in case one does come on a collision course with our planet. And these images allowed us to make a GIF animation that you see here of the movement of the asteroid. And so it's quite interesting that we can use radar to do this and to give us a better understanding of this asteroid that leaves behind the debris trail that creates the Geminids each year. As an aside, the reason why I wanted to add radar images of 3200 Phaethon was to pay tribute to the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. As you may have heard on the news recently, that observatory just suffered catastrophic failure when some of its guide and support wires failed early in the year. And then just this past December 1st, the huge receiver that hung over the thousand foot dish collapsed obliterating the 900 ton facility. It was a really sad day for astronomy and for the entire scientific community. And what's crazy is this collapse was actually caught on drone footage. And this drone was being used just recently to survey earlier damage. And then it just so happened that huge receiver started falling and obliterating the dish below it. So it's pretty extraordinary this was on film but sad at the same time. Now you may know Arecibo from popular culture in the James Bond movie, GoldenEye. It's featured prominently at the end of that movie, if you remember. Also in the Jodie Foster movie, Contact, which was written by Carl Sagan, Jodie Foster's character actually works at Arecibo. And so it's in our popular culture, but its legacy really shines in the kind of science it gathered and how it helped us to understand the universe. It could do so much, do pure astronomy, radio and radar astronomy, it could do planetary sciences, atmospheric and ionospheric sciences, and it could even be used to look for intelligent extraterrestrial life. It was used to listen to life if there's any life sending us signals, and also even used to send signals out there in the universe if there's any intelligent life listening. Well, we sent signals with Arecibo out there telling them who we are and where we are and all that fun stuff. And so Arecibo has done so, so much. And after 57 years of use, it was built in the Cold War era. It survived hurricanes and storms and earthquakes. From all that time, it couldn't take any more. But it did so much more and its legacy will live on. And so this is kind of tribute to that. And maybe a new observatory will be built or something even better next time around. And no worries about this kind of facility being gone. We do have other similar facilities out there, radar and radio facilities, 
looking out there in the universe, looking for near-Earth objects and doing all the other science that these things do. But there was nothing like Arecibo. It was a one-of-a-kind instrument that could do so much science. So it's sad to see it go, but maybe this will motivate us to do even better next time. So we will see. Thank you for joining me on another edition of Our Sky Tonight. And as usual, please join us in the Loman Planetarium if you're in the area and visiting Moaz here in Daytona Beach. We're doing shows every day, and if you buy admission, you get a show for free. Or if you're a member, you get all the shows for free, which is a great deal. And hope to see you back here again for another edition of The Sky Tonight. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, happy stargazing and happy Geminids viewing.